All right, Colossians 1 today. If you have your Bibles, uh, you want to have them open because we're going to work our way through this section verse by verse, basically. And uh, maybe you can take some notes in the margins or highlight sections that uh, strike you as uh, particularly interesting or applicable to yourself. And uh, that way you basically write your own commentary uh, as you go along. Before we get started, let's uh, go before the Lord and ask His, uh, His Spirit to move through His Word, and then we'll jump in. Father in Heaven, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Christ, what He did on the cross. As we look at Him today, we pray that we can see clearly. We pray that Your Holy Spirit will move in our hearts and in our minds. Father, just do away with any sense of rebellion. Father, cut through uh, all of the walls that we put up between you and ourselves. So that we will surrender to you completely and fully. And so we give you this time. Resting in the promise that your word will not return empty. Father, it will accomplish what you want it to accomplish. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Okay, just a little thought about last week. Uh, of course, Colossians was written to the church in Colossae. Uh, they were very cosmopolitan people. It was the uh, crossroads of many of the trade routes in the Roman Empire. And with all of that came a lot of different philosophies, some rather weird ones as well, and religions. And so they were struggling trying to determine uh, what was and what wasn't truth. And uh, Nate covered Paul's prayer uh, for the folks in Colossae last, last week. And we're going to just look at verses 9 and 10. He says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. And you might want to highlight this, growing in the knowledge of God. Growing in the knowledge of God. That, that doesn't mean just facts. You know, God is the creator, God is eternal, God is all-powerful, or God is all-knowing, or God is omnipresent, He is everywhere at once. It's not just the facts. He's talking here about knowing Him in, in the same way that you know your spouse, or you know your children, or you know your best friend. Uh, you know their ins and outs, you know uh, what makes them uh, joyful, you know what brings tears to their eyes, you know them inside and out is the old expression. And Paul's prayer for the church in uh, Colossae was that they would know God, they would grow in their knowledge of God, and they would learn to know Him in and out, if you were. Because he knew that that really was the bulwark against those philosophies and weird religions that were coming down the line. I title this, He's Worth It All, because the Apostle Paul and uh, the other apostles, I think, oh, I know, would say, knowing Him is worth any price that you would have to pay. Jesus told the story, the pearl of great price, remember that? The so farmer went out in the field to uh, plow, and as he was plowing, he turned over the land, and up came a uh, beautiful pearl. It was very expensive and very valuable, and he went and he sold everything he had so that he could possess that pearl. And Jesus said, so is the kingdom of God. It's worth everything you have to possess. He is worth it all. And today, I, I was excited about this text because it's talking specifically about the character of Jesus. And, and in a sense, it's not in the normal way that we think of. We normally think of the meek and the mild and the humble. Uh, Jesus as He ministers and, and uh, heals and teaches. But today we're going to talk about the majesty and the power and the might and the authority of Christ. 
In fact, I think this side of Christ we tend to kind of shy away from on occasion because it makes us a little nervous. In the Old Testament, they refer to Jesus as the Lion of Judah. A beautiful, majestic, strong, powerful animal, but it makes us nervous. Even when we go to the zoo, if you've been to the Omaha Zoo, and you've been into the uh, uh, house of the big cats, uh, you, you know that uh, the tigers there and the lions have enclosures. And um, you walk into the building and there's just a big thick pane of glass between you and them. And as, as they pace back and forth and you come eyeball to eyeball about two feet away from them, you're thinking to yourself, well, that's not much between he and me and I hope there's enough glass there. I hope that'll hold. You know, it makes you just a little nervous, uh, even though you're captured by their beauty and by their power. You're just a little nervous about it, and I think that's a good, healthy point of view as we think about our relationship to Christ and who He really is. And I kind of hope that you'll end up there because in a, in a sense I think that's what Proverbs means when it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, when we see Jesus for who He really is, when we see God for who He really is, in His majesty and in His power and in His authority and in His might as well as in His beauty, it makes us a little bit nervous. And that's okay. That's the beginning of wisdom. So we're going to plunge right in here in uh, Colossians chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 15 and we're going to work through this a verse at a time. We're going to stop as we go and, and draw some truth from each one. Paul writes, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is the image of God who is invisible, the firstborn. Now the Bible from cover to cover reminds us that it isn't natural for people to seek God. Now they may seek after a God and create gods in their own image that give them some sense of comfort. But they really don't look to find the one true God in His power and in His might and in His majesty. In fact, it ended up that God revealed Himself in Christ. John 14, 7, Jesus said, If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know Him and have seen Him. We have trouble discovering God. He has to reveal Himself to us. And He did so in Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to know who God is, if you really want to get to know Him, the ins and outs, what makes Him happy, what makes Him sad, what makes Him angry, what brings a tear to His eye, if you really want to know, then you look at Jesus. If you want to know how He feels about your sin and your rebellious spirit and the fear that makes you hedge from obedience, look at Jesus. If you really want to know how He feels about keeping the rules, a religion that keeps the rules and has such a focus on the rules that a relationship, a heart change is not even in the picture. It's out, out here somewhere and you don't even think about it. Look at Jesus. Watch him as a prostitute kneels before him and washes her, his feet with her tears and dries his feet with her hair and he extends grace to her as the religious people off in the corner are murmuring, grumbling, and gossiping and complaining that if he really was a godly man, he wouldn't ever associate with somebody like that. Watch him as he's approached by a leper uh, who probably hadn't had any human touch for years. And before he healed him, the Bible goes out of its way, especially in the Gospel of Luke, to say he touched him. Watch him as he calls Matthew, the tax collector, hated by the entire community, whose friends were by social standards, all the dregs at the bottom of the barrel, but invites Jesus to his party, and Jesus goes, and he's 
Spending time with them in Matthew's house, meanwhile, all the religious people are grumbling and complaining and gossiping and whispering, wondering why it is that someone who claimed to be a godly man would associate with anybody like that. You, you watch him as he goes into Zacchaeus' house. You remember Zacchaeus, a wee little guy? Also a tax collector, and he spends a few hours with them. And Zacchaeus is completely changed. And Jesus said, today, salvation has come to your house. Watch him as he rides into Jerusalem and weeps over Jerusalem. And he says, I would have gathered you to myself like a hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't. If you really want to know God, read the Gospels, watch Jesus, get to know Him, because if you have seen Him, you have seen God. So the question is, on a practical level, would we engage with culture the world around us, whether it's at work or whether it's at the neighborhood or whether it's with our unbelieving friends or unbelieving family, is it easy for them to see Jesus in us? Are we showing them who He is? Because in fact, that really is our calling. Is it easy for them to understand that we are devoted to Him? Clearly seen, not in an obnoxious, self-righteous, holier-than-thou way, uh, but in a loving, kind, gentle way. What do we look like? Do we really look like Him out there when we're doing business, when we're at a sporting event, and the ref makes a lousy call? If somebody betrays us, somebody cheats us. Do we look like Jesus? Some of you will remember Joe. Uh, Joe was a drunk. He had a reputation in the inner city for uh, uh, being a totally hopeless derelict. He was dirty. He was stinky. Uh, he spent a lot of his time uh, in a homeless shelter. Uh, totally dependent on uh, the care of, of the people there. It was a mission, and every night uh, there would be a short service and a devotion. And he came to Christ during that time. Miraculously, uh, the gospel entered his heart, and it transformed him. And once he came to Christ, he completely changed. Everything changed. He cleaned himself up, he got away from the alcohol, and uh, he spent a lot of time at the mission. He, he would do anything that was necessary, uh, no, no matter what the task was, he would never say, well, that's, you know, that's beneath me, I, you better find somebody else to do that. You know, it, it might be cleaning up vomit from one of the other alcoholics who came in. Uh, off the street or cleaning up the toilets after the guys uh, left it filthy. It, he would feed anybody that stumbled in high or drunk. He would clean them up, dress them up, and tuck them in every night. And, and um, uh, there was a, a man there who was also a drunk, and he had been coming to the mission, and he had gotten acquainted with Joe during one of the evening services, uh, the message of the gospel penetrated his heart. And in tears, he stood up at the end and he walked down to the front and he knelt and he began to pray, Lord, change me, change my heart. Make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. Please make me like Joe. And the mission director sat down beside him and he said, don't you think it might be more appropriate to say, Lord, make me like Jesus? And he paused for a little bit. And then he looked at him and he said, is he anything like Joe? When we're out there in the community, do we look like Jesus? It's a good question. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And our, our calling is to be able to say to the world, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. Do we look like him? It's a good question. It's a question I have to ask myself all, all the time. And, and, and you know, and I know that we all have a ways to go before we can answer that in an affirmative, solid, 100% yes. I look like Jesus out there. 
Well, let's go on because we have five points today, not three. Let's take a look at uh, verses 16 and 17. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Let's look back up at verse 15, make a point. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Almost forgot that. Uh, the, what does that idea mean, firstborn over all creation? Does that mean Jesus is the first, first thing that God created? No, not at all. We just read it. He was before all things. He, God didn't create Jesus. Jesus is God. And it was through him all things were created. Jesus not only shows us who God is, he is God. He is the creator. That idea of firstborn doesn't mean he is, he is firstborn among all of God's creation. It carries with it, in Hebrew thought, a sense of rank or superiority or uh, supremacy over all creation. And if you looked at that, you might want to under underline over. He is the firstborn over all creation, not among. It's sort of like the president is the commander-in-chief over the military. He's not one of the military. He is over them. He is the firstborn of the military. That's how that word firstborn is understood in this context. The creator, he has authority. And he demonstrated that authority over and over and over again. As you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can see the power and authority and the majesty of Christ. You know, he, he stands up. Uh, in the middle of the boat, in the middle of the night, when a huge storm comes barreling down out of the hills surrounding the Sea of Galilee, and the disciples were terrified that the boat was going to sink, and he stands up and he says, Peace! Be still! And the storm didn't argue. The Bible says immediately, the sea got calm and the wind died down. There was no argument. See the response of the demons when he was confronted with people who were demon-possessed? Remember the, the guy who was the Gadarene? He was possessed by a legion of demons. And uh, he was naked and he lived in the cemetery. They had tried to chain him up and he broke the chains. He was extraordinarily strong. Uh, he was crazy. He was wild and nobody could have anything to do with him. They had just given up on him. And when Jesus confronted them, they were terrified. Are you here? Are, are you here to throw us out into the void? Don't, don't throw us out. They begged him. Don't throw us out into the emptiness, out into the void. They were terrified of Jesus. Instead, you remember, he, he cast them into a herd of pigs uh, nearby, and the pigs ran down the hill and were drowned in the sea. He was the firstborn over all creation. And that word, all, is important as well. And there's an interesting thing to note here in verse 16. He says, uh, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority. All things have been created through him and for him. Now of all the things that was created, and Jesus was the creator. Why did he pick these things which were invisible? Thrones, dominions, authorities. 
You know, there are millions of things he could have talked about. He could have talked about the stars. He could have talked about the sun. He could have talked about the weather. He could have talked about the mountains or the ocean or the animals and the variety of animals. Uh, he could have talked about all kinds of things. But instead, he talks about these things. Thrones, who are these things? Thrones, dominions, authorities. Well, in the second chapter, about verse 15, it tells us these are demonic powers. The spiritual realm out there in the heavenlies that has set itself up against the authority of God. And here Paul is reminding us that Jesus created them. He created all things, in the invisible and the visible, Everything in heaven and on earth, including the authorities in the demonic realm. Now understand, he didn't create them evil. He created them good, and they fell into evil on their own. But he's emphasizing that he has authority even over them. That's his focus. He said all things were created through him and for him. That's an interesting thing as well. I, I think for him in two different ways. Number one, for his pleasure. You ever wonder, uh, does God look at a sunset and say, man, that's good work? I, I kind of wonder. Uh, Diane, in, in one of her uh, uh, morning devotions, was talking about God having a sense of humor. And uh, one of the uh, illustrations that came up, one of the examples that came up was the platypus, the duckbill platypus. You know, it has a body like a beaver, a tail like a beaver, uh, but a duckbill, and it's a mammal, but it lays eggs. Uh, and you, you wonder if God looks at that and goes, that, that was a good one. That's a good joke. Does he chuckle at that? I, I, I really wonder if God takes pleasure in the creation, and I think he does. Otherwise, he wouldn't have created it. Does he look at, a, at the stars in the sky and say, you know, that, that was gorgeous. That was beautiful. That, I really, that's my best work. Does he look at us and say, that is even my best work? I think all things were created for him, for his pleasure, but ultimately also for his glory. I guess that's, that's the important thing. And that's what Paul is trying to point out here. It, it, all things were created for his glory. We, we look at a night sky and the Psalms come to mind, don't they? Psalm 89, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament is handiwork. Uh, we look at the Rockies and we're marveling at the power and the glory of God or uh, the power of the ocean reflects the glory, the majesty, the power of Jesus, the creator. They are created for his glory. And the demonic world, the thrones and the dominions and the authorities in the spiritual realm that have set themselves up uh, against God and against Jesus, he created originally for his glory. And in the end, he will regain his glory as they are defeated. And the Bible says all of his enemies will become his footstool. He is the Lord of creation. He created all things for himself. And in everything, he holds all together. He holds it all together. That's an interesting thought. And we don't normally think about that, but it is. You woke up this morning and your fingers were still on your hand. That's because Jesus is holding all of it together. You, you wake up this morning, your nose is still on your face, your hair is still... That's a bad example, never mind that one. <laughs> your nose is still on your face, your ears are still there. It's because Jesus is holding everything together. The sun comes up, it's because Jesus holds everything together. The planets are in their orbits because Jesus holds everything together. There's a promise in the Old Testament that says uh, uh, winter, spring, summer, fall. These seasons will continue until Jesus comes again. Why? Because he holds everything together. It is the mind of Christ that holds all together. 
That's an amazing thought. And aren't you glad he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? That he's not going to change his mind? What would happen if he changed his mind? You know, your fingers would fly off your hand. You know, everything would be chaos. But he's got it all in order. And he holds it all together. we got to move on quickly. That's just two. We're not even halfway there. Verse 18, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He is the head of his body, the church. Now you've heard that before, um, probably a lot if you've been in Christian circles for very long and have read your Bible very much. And the illustration is relatively easy to see. He compares the church with a body having many members, and each member has different functions. But even as your body is dependent on your head, your brain, to dictate to it, um, so we are dependent on Christ, who is the head of the church, his body. We get into trouble, don't we? When something happens within our body and our muscles, our hands, our feet, our lungs, our tongue uh, become independent of our brains and uh, some of you remember Danny and Sally, they had multiple sclerosis. Severe, And their hands would flail. They couldn't talk. Their feet would flail. They would laugh. We loved them dearly. And they moved to Minnesota. We hated to see them leave. But that's, it was chaos in their bodies because their muscles wouldn't listen to their brains. It's because of your brain you can reach out and pick up a piece of paper or brush your teeth or put a fork in your mouth, stuff with food. It's easy to see that correlation there, that he is the head, he's the boss, he's the final say in the church. But as I was looking at this, I, I saw more, um, and something we want to bring up. Any, anybody here ever been hurt by the church? Anybody here know some Christians? I guess I'm the only one. Did anybody else's hands go up? Ever have a Christian betray you or talk behind your back or cheat you out of something? You ever hear yourself or somebody else look at the life of a believer and say, oh, so that's a Christian? That's a Christian. I don't want anything to do with it at all. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, you know, I'd go to church except it's full of... Yeah, we've all heard it. It's full of hypocrites. People who don't live out. They, they don't live up to what they say they believe. They say they believe something on Sunday, but their lives don't demonstrate it through the week. And if you're here today and that's your gut reaction to the church, then maybe it's because, well, it's... it's Let's back up on that. Maybe you should stop and think about something. Maybe you found a home here. The church is full of hypocrites, and that's why I belong. That's why I feel comfortable here. None of us really live up to what we profess to believe. That's just part of human nature. And if you're saying, you know what, these people are just full of hypocrites, they don't live up to what they believe, that's good news, because maybe you find a place where you can belong. You can fit in, because surely, somebody said, surely you're not saying you live up to every standard you've ever set for yourself, all of the vows that you've ever set to yourself. Surely you're not saying that. So since we all fall short of even our own value system, you, you will belong in the church. 
And the message here is this. We are still the church. By God's grace, God's grace is big enough to cover those sins. God's grace is big enough to cover your sin, your hypocrisy. And by God's grace, He is still the head of the church. And He's taking the church, and we're not perfect by any means, but He's moving us that direction. He is the head of the church. He has the final say. He said, I am the way, the truth. And truth isn't up for grabs. It isn't up for a vote by the congregation. It isn't up and concerned about being politically correct. It isn't concerned about popular opinion. The truth is the truth, and Jesus is the truth. He is the head of the church, the boss of the church, has the final say. But more than that, the message here is that He has grace enough to cover our sin and our hypocrisy and our inconsistencies as we struggle to live for Him. In verse 18... Let's take a look at the text again. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Now the firstborn here is used differently than uh, he is the firstborn of, of all creation. Did you notice that? Originally, firstly, we saw that he was firstborn over all, right? Right? Here, Paul says, he is the firstborn among the dead. He was once crucified, dead, and buried. He was among the dead, but he was the first to be raised from the dead. The firstborn. And because he was raised from the dead, then we have that promise of resurrection as well. And that's what... That's what our faith is all about. I promise that on that day, the dead in Christ will be changed, be raised, and will meet Him in the air. He has authority over all creation. He has authority even over death itself. And this is unique to Christianity. This is what sets... Christianity apart from every other world religion. J just think about what they are. Oh, Mohammed uh, died and is buried in Medina, Saudi Arabia. They can go to his tomb and see it there. Buddha died and was cremated and there is a shrine to him and I can't even pronounce the name of it in, in India and you can go there and you can see where he was cremated you can see where his ashes are and all of these relics that were set up in honor of Buddha Confucius died and is buried in Khufu, China and on and on and on the list goes the difference between Christianity and the rest of the world religion is that we don't go to a tomb to worship because the founder of our faith is alive. He was dead, but he is now alive, the firstborn from among the dead. That's an amazing thought. Look at verses 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He made peace. This is where we really get into the gospel. I like this. He made peace. He reconciled all things to himself. How? By the cross. Look at verses 21 and 22. 
Here's the gospel in a nutshell. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Romans says, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were in rebellion against God. Our minds did not mesh with the mind of God. We were out to do our own thing in our own way, thinking in many ways we are smarter than God, even though we wouldn't verbalize that. We know how life works. And that separated us from Him. There's this huge cavern between us and Him that sin creates, and there's no way that we can bridge it. Except Jesus bridged it through the cross. He reconciled us to Himself. He made peace on the cross. He bore our sin on the cross. It, there was a transaction that happened on the cross. The Bible says he became sin. God took all of our sins. All of my sin, all of your sin, all of the sins of every person that has ever lived and dumped them onto Christ and he became sin. And then he took Christ's righteousness, Christ's goodness, Christ's innocence, and he imputed it to us. He gave it to us. Galatians 3.27 says when we are baptized into Christ, we are clothed with him. We put on his righteousness. So there's a transaction that happens on the cross and he makes peace with a people who were once alienated in their sin. And he reconciles them. He brings peace because of the cross. Why? Did you catch that? Let's take a look at it. To present you holy in His sight. That word holy kind of has a mysterious ring to it, doesn't it? Kind of a re religious ring to it. And... Um, it's kind of a preacherly word, and we sing holy, 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 and we're not sure what it means. You know what holy means? It means simply to be set apart, to be different, to be distinctive. Psalm 89 says, Who is like you, God? Is there anybody like there? There is nobody like you. You are so high above all creation that there's no comparison with anything at all in creation. There is nobody like you. You are holy. And Christ went to the cross, bore our sin, gave us His righteousness to make us holy, to make us distinctive, to set us apart from the rest of the world. So the whole point of living out the Christian life is to be different. We think different. Our values are different. Our goals in life are different. We behave differently in a distinctive way. That's what we mean by holy. Holy doesn't mean goody two-shoes. It means distinctive, set apart. God refers to the church as people who are called out from the world. Why? To be holy, to be distinctive, different. Jesus said, be holy even as God is holy. Be separate, distinctive. Jesus said it this way in John 15, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. Highlight that. But I have chosen you out of the world. Highlight that. That is why the world hates you. You've heard that phrase probably. You are in the world, but not of the world. Don't get too comfortable here. Don't feel too much at home here. Jesus is telling us, because you don't belong here. This is not your home. You're just here for a while. You're traveling through. 
Your home is with Him in that place as He has created for you. He has made peace to make us holy and also to make us pure. 1 John 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light, and He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, purifies us from all sin. He makes peace through the cross, reconciles us to Himself, takes upon Himself our sin, gives us His righteousness so that we will be different than the world, holy and pure. Not because we're sinless, <laughs> but because He washes our sin away. His blood purifies us from all unrighteousness. We just read that. And He continues, washes our sins away, washes our sins away, washes our sins away. And so we stand before Him pure. We may not feel that way because we know we struggle with the old flesh. But because of what He did on the cross, we are pure. His blood washes our sins away. And then we are free from accusation. I love that. Look at Romans 8, verses 31 through 34. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. That's the cross. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. That, that is an interesting courtrooms type scene. It's kind of like this. We die and we appear before God in judgment. And Satan is the prosecuting attorney, and uh, we're standing before the throne of God, and Satan says, yeah, but Rod did And Jesus says, I got it. I covered it. Satan says, yeah, but he did And Jesus said, I covered that. And Satan says, yeah, but he did And Jesus said, yeah, I covered that. Jesus is always interceding for us. Satan is accusing. Jesus is interceding. That's a cool thought. He's the defense attorney. He's saying, I've covered that. I've covered that. That's gone. That's taken away. It is no more. Don't worry about it. We are free from any accusation. Now, it's true. You know, our, our spouses might accuse us of being insensitive when we are. <laughs> uh, we might be accused uh, rightly so, being self-centered or prideful, those things. But in the end, Jesus' blood washes our sins away. And as Satan accuses, Jesus says, I've got it. I've got it. Don't worry about it. It's called grace. So here we are at the end of it all, asking that question. So what? Who cares? What does this all mean to me? Well, verse 23 gives us a hint. He says, if you continue in your faith and established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under, the, under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. What it means to me is that I need to hang on. Hang on. Because God's not finished yet. He's in the process of taking His creation back to where we were in the beginning, in Eden. But that's not going to happen on this world in this lifetime, probably. 
The Bible says there will come a time when there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And it's at that point Eden is back in the picture and everything is made perfect. But hang on, because he's moving that direction. Paul's saying here, guys, hang on. Stay firm, stay convinced, stay faithful. And all of this hope is yours. This hope that you've seen and heard in the gospel that I preach to you is yours if you hang on. Don't turn your back on the faith. There's a neat picture in Isaiah 11, verse 6, of what the world will be like on that day. He says, The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. Finally, everything, everything ultimately will be reconciled to Christ because of the cross. It all centers on what Jesus did on the cross. Taking our sin upon himself, becoming sin, paying the price for us, and then giving us his righteousness, clothing us with his goodness, his purity. Hang on. Life can be tough. There's a lot of weird philosophies out there. We're a lot like Colossae. That lots of weird stuff going on. Weird ideas. Strange philosophies. Strange religions. And it's really kind of scary. But hang on. He is the truth. Knowing Him is worth any price that you have to pay. Because in the end, in the end, he will split the sky. He will come and gather his people to himself. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Eden will be restored. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that. I want to be there. And we can be there. Not because we're good. Not because of what we've done. But because of his blood, his grace. And that's what we celebrate around the Lord's table. And so I'm going to dismiss the ushers, and we're going to prepare ourselves to receive the Lord's Supper. Remembering his broken body and his shed blood, that he made peace, he reconciled all things to himself on the cross. He brought us into his family. We have a relationship with him because of what he did on the cross. So I want to invite you to share with us as we uh, gather around his table of remembering him. But right now I want to give you a few moments of quiet just to do business with him and prepare yourself to receive these emblems and I'll pray and they will serve, okay? Father in heaven, we come before you and Father, as we read this text, we are amazed at who Jesus is, who you are. That he is the creator. He is the firstborn over all creation and all things were made through him and for him. And in the end, he will get the glory. And Father, he made peace on the cross and he brings us into your family because his blood takes our sins away and we remember his body and blood, what he did on the cross by taking this bread and this juice, his body and his blood. So work in our hearts now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.